especially when they're directed at us. Would you like a cup of coffee? Can I give you a ride? Would you like to come to my house for dinner? All of those questions leave us wanting to answer, yes, yes, yes. Come in out of the rain. Here's a little money. I know of a place that can help you, and I'll help you give them a call. I'm sure you're thirsty. Here's a cup of cold water. We know what hospitality sounds like, whether in Jesus' day or in ours. And we know why we should be hospitable. All people have equal value in the eyes of God. There's an ancient Jewish Midrash story that says that each person has a band of angels going before him or her and proclaiming, make way, make way, here comes an image of God. Imagine what our lives would be like if we were always conscious of that fact. According to Matthew, there, these are some of the words of instruction spoken by Jesus to his 12 disciples before he went out to their cities to teach and preach. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, Jesus says. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Scholars say that in the name of probably means as such. So, whoever welcomes a prophet as such, or as a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person because he or she is righteous, will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, meaning a disciple, because he or she is a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Last month when I went to Synod Assembly, one of our speakers pointed out that Jesus in these verses is not so much trying to get the disciples to be welcoming as he is saying that anyone who helps them will be rewarded. Anyone who welcomes them welcomes Jesus and welcomes God who sent him. If you think about it, that's a pretty revolutionary thing to say. Now admittedly, the world of Jesus' time was much different from ours. When Jesus' disciples went out as sheep into the midst of wolves, as he said, they were going to a world that had never before heard of Jesus, or his life, or his message, or what he ultimately meant for the world. The welcome that people might extend to the disciples would reflect how open they were, how willing they were to receive the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. By contrast, in our time, many more people have heard of Jesus, or at least have heard of some of the things that followers of Jesus have done. Some of these things are wonderful, truly showing care for people, animals, and the earth. And some of those things are definitely not good news. They are awful. Sensational things that end up as front page news stories that make some people say, why would I want to be a Christian? The good things usually end up in a newspaper's faith section or buried somewhere inside where all the front page news stories end. And all the good news in the world can't entirely blot out the impact those bad news stories carry. When we go out, like sheep into the midst of wolves. It is usually to our own families, to good friends, to our neighbors, or co-workers who don't want to hear any of that canned church talk. Unlike the ones who received those first disciples, most of these people have some opinion of Christianity, and maybe even of the Episcopal type of Christianity. We may encounter hostility, but we are just as likely to encounter boredom or discomfort or at least a sense that they've heard it all before. <clears throat> Traditional evangelism just doesn't work these days, even if we felt comfortable doing it, and most of us don't. But what people always hear is <coughs> welcoming, help, 
multiple actions. They hear when we recognize that they also are an image of God. And although Jesus originally meant his disciples when he used the term one of these little ones, we know that there are little ones everywhere we look. Some of them are children. Some of them are people who have been hit hard by circumstances. Some of them are a different race or class or sexual orientation than we are. Some even consider themselves members of this congregation but find it difficult to get here regularly. Some of them are inside and some are outside these four walls. I don't know how many of you read the Times Standard, but yesterday's faith section, speaking of faith sections, had an interesting column by Terry Mattingly, who's a syndicated religion writer. He reported that the New York City School Board, focusing on congregations that rent school space in order to have a place to worship, has banned regular worship services in any of its schools, and the Second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals has backed their decision. Judge, Judge Pierre Laval wrote, when worship services are performed in a place, the nature of the site changes. The site is no longer simply in a room, in a school, being used temporarily for some activity. The place has, at least for a time, become the church. Now, did you hear that? I'm going to read that again. He said, when worship services are performed in a place, the nature of the site changes. The site is no longer simply in a room in school being used temporarily for some activity. The place has, at least for a time, become the church. Mattingly quotes a spokesperson from the Alliance Defense Fund who says that the implication is that a mysterious transformation literally takes place during these worship services. He concludes, there isn't some kind of architectural alchemy at work here that suddenly turns a school facility into a dangerous place. Now the interesting thing is, I think, that if we are welcoming and being welcomed inside and outside this building, which, unlike some congregations, we own and don't have to rent. There ought to be mysterious transformations happening here and everywhere we go. If we truly believe that images of God are all around us, and we act in response to God's love outside this place, who knows what might happen? But what we do need to realize, also, is that welcoming in welcoming or being hospitable, we should honor the spaces between people, especially those who are strangers to us. As Quaker author Parker Palmer writes in his book, The Company of Strangers, hospitality means letting the stranger remain a stranger while offering acceptance nonetheless. It means honoring the fact that strangers already have a relationship rooted in our common humanity, without having to build one on intimate personal knowledge, without having to become friends. It means valuing the strangeness of the stranger, even letting the stranger speak a language you cannot speak, or sing a song you cannot join with, resisting the temptation to reduce the relation to some lowest common denominator, since all language and all music is already human. It means meeting the stranger's needs while allowing him or her simply to be, without attempting to make the stranger over into a modified version of ourselves. Every hospitable act is an outward and visible sign of our inward and invisible unity, a unity which finds expression in the very root of the word hospitality. For hospice means both host and guest, the two are really one. An outward and visible sign of our inward and invisible unity, it sounds very much 
like the Book of Common Prayer Catechism explanation of the sacraments as outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual grace. In a sense, whenever we are welcoming or act in hospitality toward another person, we're acting sacramentally. The mission of the church is to be Christ's body in the world, given and broken for the sake of the world. In this place, we are open, we are welcoming, and we can always become more welcoming. And we know that our worship carries us out into the world that God loves. We know that although we love the one who first loved us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's not an exclusive love. We can't hoard it for ourselves alone because it is much too precious. That love, that welcome, that hospitality is for all those made in the image of God and indeed for all parts of God's creation. It must be shared with all of the little ones who need it just as we do. I'm reminded of the old 1970s movie, Harold and Maude. I don't know how many of you have ever seen it. At the end, as Maude is leaving Harold for the last time, he tells her through tears, I love you. I love you. The strength of that emotion and, and its particularity mean everything to the young man. Seasoned and wise Maude responds by patting his arm. That's wonderful, she says with love and sincerity. Now, go and love some more. Let us share all that we have in welcome and allow ourselves to be welcome beyond this place where we love and know that we are loved. Let us invite and include in hospitality. Let us go and love some more.